That's right. Reality check in on me. Welcome to the Executive Lounge, the business leadership program that brings you insights and nuggets from captains of industry, men and women who have scaled the hurdles of growing and managing enterprises in several different sectors across the country. Today, we'll be talking to a man who has brought more than 17 years of experience to a finance house and has grown it to become the business of the year. Our guest on Executive Lounge today is Mr. Kenneth Kwamina Thompson, CEO of Dalex Finance. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. <laughs> sure. Hello. How are you? Very well. Thank you, Ken. Good <laughs> to have you. Good to, good to be here. Good yes. to be here. Dalex Finance was adjudged the business of the year. And you, at the same mating edition of the Ghana Economic Forum Excellence Awards, adjudged the businessman of the year. How did you get there? I don't think you can wake up in the morning. I, 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 you don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to become a business of the year. Uh, I don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to be a business of the year. But I wake up in the morning and I say to myself, I want to build an institution. How am I going to go about it? And if along the way, you know, you become, you get these awards, it's nice. But you, you, you can't set yourself out to, um, win awards. I mean, you, you can't, your game plan can't be that I want to win awards. So I don't wake up in the morning to even think I want to make money. For me, I'll make money if I, if I work hard enough and I'm lucky. But money doesn't motivate me. What motivates me is I want to build an institution. And I want to build an institution that is enduring. So at the award, they said I got it for uh, thought leadership, for employment creation, for a CSR, activities and for innovation, which was nice. But for me, I think it's just, we've been working. These few years we've been working and it's just nice to get these things. That's good. Let's get to know Ken. <laughs> you know, uh, what was your upbringing like? Was you see, I, 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 do you know, I still hold, I hold the record as the heaviest baby was born in Kolibu Hospital. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I hold it. Yes, 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 yes. So, so you, you started as you uh, intended oh, I to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm the classic, you know, for the younger viewers, they don't know about lactogen. Mm -hmm. But I was the lactogen baby. You know, I, I was the lactogen baby. You know, I was pampered to high heaven. Um, you know, I, I was brought to my mother and my grandmother. I have a sister. We had twins. So for me, life was very straightforward. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember in those days, weekends, we go to the cinema. Then they had Kingsway, we we'll go to Kingsway, you know, buy fresh milk. You know, it, it was it was it was an easy life. It was an easy life. And I never it took me it took me quite a long time to actually realise that if I wanted to achieve anything, I had to do it myself because everything was done for me. Mm. I mean everything was done for me. Wow. So what kind of values do you think you picked as a child and from the family setting and the societal setting? See, yeah. Everyone. Growing up, there are certain things that I grew up with. Um, I grew up with music. There was a lot of music at home. Mm -hmm. You know, Harry Belafonte, Ray Charles, there was so much music. I also grew up with order. You know, my, my, my grandmother was extremely clean and orderly. Then I also saw a lot of hard work. You know, my mother worked hard, my grandmother worked hard. Then from a very early age, um, I was taught how to give. Because even at that time, we used to have a lot of relatives come to stay with us. And when you're a child, you know, you sort of get, uh, it's almost as if they're invading your space. And you think that you're, you're being made to share the little that you have. And of course, when some of them came, you know, they came from the village, they had certain habits you didn't like. And it was only at a much later age that I realized that I was being taught how to give at, in a very practical way. So for me, that, that's how I grew up. And my mother was extremely forthright. My mother was, she spoke her mind. Uh, she didn't suffer fools. Um, she, and that's, that's what I knew. That's Sounds what I knew. like you took after her. I, I'm not quite, not quite. But um, I think that at some point, who you are actually comes out. So whatever I do, it takes me back to when I was maybe five years old, because I think that's what I know. And for me, speaking my mind, that's what I do. You know, I used to live with some guys in um, the UK. When I was in the UK, I shared a house with these guys. 
And you know, there used to be a, a boxer called something the Truth Williams, mm. a heavyweight boxer. I think Don, yes. And they used to call me Ken the Truth Williams because I'll speak my mind. And I've never found that to be an issue. And sometimes I wonder why people can't speak their mind. I'm saying, but this is the issue. Why are you dancing around it? So that's, that's, that's where I've come from. Let's, let's go a little further into your childhood, say at uh, secondary school level. Were you one of the biggest kids in the school? When I went to school, I was picked on a lot. And uh, I honestly didn't understand why they were picking up on me. Because think about it. This is somebody who, at 11 years old, I enter, I enter secondary school. I'm the youngest in the form. I'm the biggest. And I'd come from a background where, you know, everything had been done for me. So I didn't know that I had to iron my shirts. I didn't know that, you know, the same things I just, you know, I remember I took, we took, we used to have um, a washman and you take your things out on Friday, you're supposed to pick up on a Sunday. But half the time, I really didn't work out how the things went and how they came back. And also when they picked on me, I actually wouldn't go and tell my mother because I knew that if I told my mother, I mean, the school would be, it would be absolute war. So it took me, I would say, I didn't learn much in secondary school because all that time, I was discovering myself, all that I was discovering myself. And I used to, some of the boys were naughty, the girls were naughty, some people used to learn, and I, I, it was all a bit of a strange experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, I would say my education really came from preparatory school. Secondary school, I didn't really learn that much. Then you leave secondary school, went to university. University, I was still discovering. But then after university, uh, at 22, I went to England, and I had to stay on my own. Then suddenly, I started to now have to try and be resourceful. Mm -hmm. And so th that's, how, that's how it happened. Interesting. Yeah. What was life like? Um, obviously, you leave your home country. You go and live on your own in another country. Um, the culture would be different. Did the culture shock present to you a hurdle that was very, very high? Or were you able to pretty much adjust and settle in? For me, what I'd say is that it wasn't so much a culture shock, but it took me some time to appreciate that things were done a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I give this example where, you know, I, I go for my first day at work, I'm sitting at the reception and uh, somebody comes in, he has a towel on his, sort of, sort of a cloth mm -hmm. on his neck and had a spray gun, went inside, came back and started to um, spray the potted plants. He sprayed the relief and cleaned it. And I thought, that's ridiculous. But it took me 10 years to realize that that's the standard. Then I also had to deal with the fact that just because someone doesn't like Ghanaian food doesn't mean they don't like me. You know, just because somebody has a different culture doesn't mean they necessarily like me or dislike me. And then also you've got to learn, you know, it taught me to be liberal. You have to be accepting of people with different views, uh, people that think in ways that are different from you. And for me, that's what it taught me. Uh, you've got to be accommodating. But at the same time, it also taught me that a standard is a standard. You know, I used to work, in an, I worked at training as a chartered accountant. And in training, the margin for error was zero. I mean, if you were given a document 500 pages thick, everything should be there. You can't, you're not even allowed to have a full stop out. And I used to think this is too much. But then later on, I realized that that is the standard. You know, that's the standard. So those are sort of things that as you go along, you adjust. But then when we went abroad, we were kids. You know, we were kids, we all went. We were, you know, these days I feel very sad when people um, sort of talk down, people that are trying to maybe go overseas. or Because we all, we went as, we really were economic refugees. Early 80s, we were all shipping out, 83, 84. And, you know, we're looking for a better life. And as far as we're concerned, we deserved a better life. So we're not too worried about challenges. As far as we, we wanted to succeed. And, you know, so then I went through that. I qualified. Um, then, you know, I did some work. Then I came back in 99. But all through that time, you know, I was discovering and learning about people, learning new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I was learning humility. You've got to learn to be humble because you've got to be open. Every day you're learning something. And I was living in a society that was changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the di difficult things was that because I didn't grow up in England, you don't have the historical perspective. So it takes you time to really understand 
what the current issues are. But those things were all part of the learning process. And I would say that really, uh, if I hadn't been overseas, I'll still be forthright. But speaking for me personally, I'll probably be a bit more ignorant. You know, a bit more ignorant. So the exposure did you some uh, great. Oh, it was fantastic experience. Absolutely fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. So you came back in '99, and then uh, you obviously went into work. Uh, here. You see, yeah. You see, in by '99, um, I was getting a bit worried. I was nowhere near the top. I was nowhere near the bottom. But I felt that you know I was always. I thought I, I need to do something. I need to take a risk. I need to you know I have to do something with my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and then two of my mates had come to Ghana, so two chartered accountants, one who I actually trained with had come to Ghana, another person, Edward, Edith had also come back, and they appeared to be doing well, so I thought, you know, what the hell, let me come back to Ghana. So I came to Ghana in 99, then in 2000, I met Alex Brooks. He had also come from the States, um, he was come through the World Bank, and we became friends. So I worked at Fidelity. Uh, he, used to work, he was working with the World Bank. He resigned from the World Bank, set up a consultancy. Then I joined him in 2003. And then 2006, we set up the Alex Finance. So really, it, was, it wasn't as if what I have, the job I'm doing now for me is my dream job. But I didn't wake up in the morning and say, this is what I want to do. But I knew that I had to. I had to, you know, there was something. I have to do something. I have to do something. So you started the election in 2006. That makes it, what? Ten uh, years. Ten yes. years um, ago. Yeah. It's grown rapidly. You've been innovative. And you have a team of dependable people. But I don't think all of this happened overnight. What, what were some of the um, quiet days or dark days, <laughs> if know? we could call it that? You know, when people come to my office, I say, you know, if, if they know the mistakes I've made, they'll say, Quantum, so you're a fool. But hindsight's a beautiful thing. Uh, we started Daylex, and the growth has been incremental. You know, you've got to, if you run a business, you've got to try and move step by step. And you've got to, you know, try and, uh, you must be passionate about it. I believe in passion. I always say that if you're not passionate, I don't want to work with you. You know, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. You have to think about going step by step. You've got to find ways to be different. Uh, you, you've got to find areas where you can uh, make some margin, areas where you can grow. And you've got to work hard. And you've got to work just damn hard, you know. You've just got to work hard. And if along the way you happen to meet people that are like-minded, then you're lucky. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you know, people, people will disappoint you. Some people will stick with you. Some, so. Every time it's evolving. But in your heart, you must be passionate about what you're doing. You must really be passionate. I'm very passionate about my work. Is passion everything? Passion uh, sorry, is passion everything? Skills I can teach. I can't teach passion. Give me a man with 95% passion and 5% skills. I'll teach the man the skills. I can't teach them passion. Everybody who works for Dalex, everybody who works for the, the group, because you have other company, you must be passionate. And if you're not passionate, I don't want to work with you. I'm not interested. Don't work with me. Do something else. Mm. Yeah, I'm not interested. Skills I can teach. And even now, I spend I about over 60% of my time teaching people how to write, how to speak, how to present, you know, all sorts of things. I don't mind that. But passion, I can't teach passion. Tough talking, straight talking, <laughs> chartered accountant, and a passionate uh, CEO and businessman. A very, very remarkable story. The finance sector uh, had started seeing some rapid evolution um, from about 2005, thereabout, uh, when you started seeing the uh, the new banks coming into the country um, from the sub-region. The non-bank financial sector has also started growing at the time. How has Dalex remained relevant in this period and seen exceptionally good growth good, good, and steady okay. growth in that period? First, I, I wouldn't say the finance industry has been innovative. They haven't been. Um, the banks, the banks really haven't done, really haven't tried to grow their business in terms of the numbers of people they are dealing with. Uh, what the banks have done is that they've done some government business, 
invested in treasury bills. I mean, that's all they've done. I mean, they haven't really been innovative. Um, if the banks had been innovative, we'll, be, we'll have um, investments in agriculture particularly, but they haven't been, which is fine. Uh, we've had a lot of new banks, that is fine. But if you take a country like Ghana, where the average wage is around maybe 300 cities you know, per month, to be successful, you need to be speaking to the mass of the people. Mm. You, you, can't, you can't live your life, you, know, you can't grow and you can't prosper if you're doing big government ticket items. In any case, those ticket items are no longer there. So now the banks will have to now be innovative. So the financial sector changed only with respect to the players that came onto the market. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot more microfinance institutions, but a lot of them came in and behaved like mini commercial banks. So rather than focus on a certain sector, they tried to do big things that really they didn't have the capital for. So that's created some problems. So for us, we in the last, in 2016, in 2016 also they had an election petition, wasn't it? Okay. That was 2000 and, uh, no, so, oh, sorry, 2013 13, was when yes. we had the election petition. In the first few years, uh, Dilex grew, not necessarily because we were doing thing, anything fantastic, but because the economy was growing. And as an accountant, you know, I was very conservative. You're very conservative, you're managing costs, uh, you're being prudent with your, your how you, what you give out. So. The, the market rewarded us. People realized that this company has been managed well. So we got more and more money to uh, on land, and that made, made us grow. In 2013, uh, we took a strategic decision. You know, um, then, before then, I'd been on a course uh, in the USA, a four-day leadership course, and it was about leadership. And it was something that didn't really struck me because one of the challenges I've had, I'd had since I started DLX was, as the company grew, I kept asking myself, how do I make this company uh, work in the way that I think a company should work? And how, how can I make the, the people in the company adopt my ethics when it comes to working? So I attended a leadership program, and one of the, they did a change program, they did culture, and I thought, my God, that's it. You know, I really have found out what we should need to do. So I came back, we implemented a change program. Then we started to look at the strategy of the company itself. So what we did was that we decided that the SME sector was dead. We said, okay, we're not going to do small loans. This 20,000, 30,000, we raised the bar. You know, raised the bar to about 500,000. Then we're also going to um, increase our sales to government workers. So what we did was that we treated the, the loans to government workers like a fast-moving consumer good. Mm. So like a fast-moving consumer good, the USPs are distribution, customer service, speed. Distribution, customer service, speed. And so we started to you know, increase the network. We opened sales points. Mm -hmm. We started paying by mobile money. And that really, it took off. It really took off. So by being very clear in our mind what we would do and what we didn't do, it allowed us to focus on the things that we should do. And we did them well, better than anybody else. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to explore the culture at Dalex, how that culture has become an enabler in growing the business and earning them the accolade of business of the year. And we'll also look at how Ken's own personality has been used to transform the fortunes of the business. This is the Executive Lounge. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me, Inshira Addo, and we are talking to the CEO of Dalex Finance, Mr. Kenneth Kwamina Thompson. Just before we went away, you talked a little bit about the lessons you learned from your four-day leadership program, and the key thing you said was culture. I kind of like the subject culture. Help us appreciate how you've created the Dalex culture. culture. Um, and, and how that's panned out for you? You know, one of the challenges I had, I mean, rolling back, was that, you know, here I'd come from England, 
um, I'd been exposed to a certain way of working. Um, I'd been trained in, in a profession which was thoroughly professional. And then I come to Ghana, and for me, I, I always had, I was always thinking about how can I impart that knowledge to the people that I'm working with, and how, I, well, how can I do? Because I've learned so many skills, you know, how do I do it? Because that's, and I'm desperate to do it. And when the culture issue came up, you know, on the course, it just struck me that really this is, I should be looking at our culture because the culture is the way you do things. Mm -hmm. and it's, the glue, it's what sticks to you together, you know, and I don't know how other companies do it in this country, but the culture is critical. Um, I'll show you how we've done it so far. So when I came back, um, I got um, a friend of mine to say, look, this culture thing, I have to do it. So uh, we used, and it's amazing because the model we used to roll out the culture program, because it was a change program, was a model by, um, I think it was Kotler. Kotler. And it's something I'd learned at school, but it made no sense to me. It made absolutely no sense. So you create um, a sense of urgency, um, you have different, you create, have ambassadors, you have, there were different steps that we did that. How did you create the culture at Dalex? And how's that working out okay. now? So when I came back from the States, you know, one of the things I learned was, uh, we talked was a lot about culture, a lot of things that were spoken about. Actually, the next course, there was so much information, and the next course that I went on, I took another director, because there was too much information being thrown at me. So what we used to do was that, at the end of every set day, we write all of the things we've learned, you know, that you know, the morning, we refresh. By the way, so we, we did Kotler, you know, and it was a case study, we did a case study together. And then I thought, damn, this is what I need to do. So I came back to Ghana, I got uh, one of a consultant who's now one of our directors, uh, we implemented the change program, so we created a ses sense of agency, build a coalition, all the steps. I went through all the steps. And the one thing about the Dalex culture is, we say we have a shoot-to-kill policy. Hmm. And at Dalex, we don't take prisoners. And we say that prisoners are expensive. Um, prisoners, you have to feed them, you have to wash them, so we don't take prisoners. But what the shoot-to-kill policy means is that if you have an issue, you've got to resolve it. And if that person doesn't resolve it, you know, you give them first, you, you, you go to them and say, look, you know, uh, give them feedback to say, you know, you are, you are standing my way to achieve a certain objective. And if they don't react or don't do what they need to do, you escalate. So you go to escalate till it comes to me. And even when it comes to me, I don't do it, you escalate. So we have what we call a shoot to kill policy. You know, we don't take prisoners. And I like to that we had culture ambassadors, we have a culture song, extra, extra. So that is what we've been doing. I mean, those, so if you go to DLX, everybody knows we have a shoot to kill policy. Hmm. Don't come and tell Mr. Thompson, I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? If it means you need to come to my house at three in the morning for me to get me to do something that you have to do, do it. If I ask you to do something and you know it's wrong and you go and do it, it's your fault. But you have to achieve your target, full stop. And the target could be anything. It could be whether you clean at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's whether you have to meet a certain deadline. You have to, you know, you have to be focused. Whatever targets you're given, you have to achieve it. And you know, we set big, big, hairy, audacious targets. I mean, three years ago, when the targets were set, I thought, my God, can we really do this? We've done it and more. You know, so that's how the culture has panned out. As a person, I don't do excuses. I don't do sorry, I don't do I can't do it. I don't do the meeting is at six o'clock, you came at one past six. I don't do that. Whatever it takes, you have to get it done. You know, and, 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 and sometimes uh, what has happened is some people get frustrated, but everybody, most people, I'll say about nine out of 10 people have left Dalex, I've come back to say thank you. And I can see where they're coming from because at some time in my life, I was at that stage where I was ignorant about you know, the dynamics of success. And uh, I'm glad that I've been able to impart that knowledge to a few more people. I'm really glad that's all done. But for us, everything has to be, I believe in perfection. 
I don't care how you do it. Mm -hmm. Just give me perfection. If you have to, you can't say, well, Mr. Thompson, I have a meeting with you at 6 o'clock, but when I came, you're annoying. Yes, that's your problem. If it means coming to my house at midnight, make sure you do it. Get it done. The point is, the principle behind it is that you, you need to strive for excellence all the time. You know, you have to. And for us, that's, that's how we've been um, operating. Powerful stuff. Um, you know, the whole idea of having ambassadors. So these are people who you select to espouse, espouse yes. the values that the culture drives. How are you able to pick the right fit? Oh, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a science. I mean, we're still going through ambassadors. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But they're human beings, uh, so that is fine. Uh, because the culture is a process. We have the, the ambassador is somebody who's supposed to. Uh, at some point, we had we had we had a sessions where each department was asked to come up with things that um, they would do in their department, which would expose the Dalek's culture. You know, we've done several things. Some have worked, some haven't worked. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I know is plain everybody's mind. Everybody knows we shoot to kill, and over time, we're building on it. But I'm not worried. I'm not worried because. We're building an institution, and it takes time. Mm -hmm. And I know that every day we take a small step. Every day we take a small step. So in time, you know, one day when I'm long gone, everybody will say shoot to kill. And nobody will really think, remember how it got to become part of the culture. But then that's what I want to achieve. Audacious and hairy. Is hairy, a big, big, hairy, hairy audacious. audacious goal. So the targets, when I look at it, I say, my God, Ken, you're such a wicked person. <laughs> 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 the sad thing is that I also learned it from a book. It's not in the books. You know, I, I, tell, I, tell, the st I tell the staff that, you see, mankind's, everything mankind knows, mankind's knowledge is being put in the book. It all be written down. So if you don't read, how are you going to get knowledge? You've got to read. I read it. And I thought, and I read it, and people are done now thinking, hmm, this makes sense. I apply it. So I do a lot of reading. I mean, I read a lot. You know, I'm always... And, and, and I want people to challenge me. I don't want people, I don't, if you're afraid of me, don't work at Dalex. I don't want you to work at Dalex. If you can't say, Mr. Thompson, you're wrong, I don't want to work with you. You should come and challenge me and say, no, this is wrong. You should do it this way. And I say, yes. But to come and accept everything that I say, I don't want to work with you. How important is a culture that allows people to um, be able to challenge the thinking of the leader, um, you know, the, the bottom up? Um, you see, communication. The one thing that any institution cannot run off away from, or any organization, is that to be successful, the team has to be successful. It's about teamwork. It's got nothing to do with me. If my team is not successful, I can't be successful. So, as a leader, you've got to do everything you can to make sure the team is successful. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when we do strategy sessions, and we have about maybe seven departments. We do a workshop, so I present the strategy, and people, and I'll say, okay, this is the old thing we should be doing this year. They said, workshop, they discuss, and we actually give uh, a prize to the person who comes off up with the most constructive uh, uh, suggestion for my strategy. I don't want to use criticism. Mm -hmm. I say, no, this is wrong. This is how I think we should do it. And yes. And even in those sessions, my contribution is probably maybe 0.001%, because I've got to get the team working. My success is not Ken Thompson. The next success, the next success is the team. So as a leader, you must get your team firing. And if you can't get your team firing, you, you fail. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. You're growing. New people come in, some will leave. How are you ensuring that the infusion of new people doesn't dilute the culture that you're building? What, what, what we've been lucky in one respect. Uh, we've been lucky in one respect. So far, if the average age of the Linux staff is around 30. So these are people that have not had, a lot of them haven't had such major influences. So it's easy for them to you know, adapt. Um, even when we have people uh, who have come in uh, at a certain level, when you come in, the company is working a certain way. 
So, because the majority are doing things a certain way, sort of also, you know, f follow in line. But we have a very young, and, and that's why I think we have a future, because the, the team is young. You know, it's, it's a young team. If you take me out, take another person out, really, the average is about 30. And I think that's the future. Wonderful. How important is culture and if, for example, you know, we would settle on Kotler's eight-step uh, mm -hmm. approach to change yeah. management, how important is culture in the scheme of things for beyond an organization like DLX, but for our nation? I mean, <laughs> Ghana, 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 Ghana is, uh, let me give you some examples. If you refer to a China nation, the first thing you think about, you may say that you must say, oh, they're hardworking. I don't think hard work and Ghanaians sit in the same sentence. And I think, as a people, I don't think we've really sat down to think about what our culture is. And um, we've known extreme poverty or some enjoyment. And really, for me, for Ghana, we need to press the reset button. We need to reset. If you ask me what the Ghanaian culture is, I'll say we talk too much. We talk about things we don't know about. We sort of haven't associated hard work with success. And it's like, you know, I'm going to give you a scenario. And you tell me what culture it is. So our house is burning. So the house is burning. And the family members are outside the house. The, the house. They have buckets of water uh, sitting uh, outside. The buckets of water are there. Okay. There's a huge argument. They're arguing. Uh, somebody has called the fire tender. Um, and the fire tender has arrived. They're still arguing. The fire tender just remembered that there probably is no, there's no water in it. And the house is burning down. Oh, what kind of culture is that? Your house is burning. All of you are there. The water is there. The fire tender is here. And you're arguing. And you can't decide who should throw the first bucket, bucket of water. What culture is that? I don't know. I, I wish somebody would tell me, but that's the culture. If you ask me to describe Ghana, that's how I describe it. How do we change that? How do you change it? We all have to change it. We, we all, you see, that's where I think that somewhere along the line, I don't know where, we stop facing reality. Mm. Uh, people talk about the thing something, but what you're saying is, it doesn't make sense. Why are you talking such, uh, why are you saying things like this? We have a culture where everybody is lying. You know, right from everybody's lying. And you have a culture where it's so bad that even the younger people are lying. I don't know where you start from to change it, but it has to change because the house is burning. And the water is there's got to change. But it's got to change because people speak out about it. We've got to speak out about it. We've got to speak out about it. I mean, I've been saying the last few weeks, and this is something I've been thinking about over the years. I can see Ghana unraveling before my eyes. You know, I can see Ghana unraveling before. I don't have a future. Because one day, I'll wake up, I'm 60-something or 70-something, if I'm lucky, my kids are home, they have nothing to do, my pension, my pension is not, not enough to feed them, and that's my life. And it's happening in my lifetime. I can see Ghana unraveling. And I don't think we have more than four years to sort it out, because I don't have a future, my children don't have a future, the house is burning, that's what I'm saying, we have the water, and we're arguing. So I don't know how we're going to solve it, and I don't know what kind of culture it is. But what I know is that on my part, I'm going to speak out against it. Because I believe that, you know, one day if I don't, I'll say back to Thompson, you saw this thing happening. What did you do about it? And that one day could be tomorrow. But I don't have a future. You see, so I don't know what culture this is. But we have to speak out. We certainly have to speak out. And we're going to explore some solutions to this uh, cultural challenge. Uh, when we come back from this break. This is the Executive Lounge. Don't go away. Welcome back 
from the break and we're still talking to Mr. Ken Thompson or Kenneth Kwamina Thompson, CEO of Dalex Finance. Now you describe Ghana as possibly not having a culture or having a culture that is not one that will guarantee uh, success or growth. If you had to prescribe as a consultant to this organization called Ghana, the processes we need to go through to bring about positive change, how will you go about it? Okay. I will make myself, you said consultant, but I'll make myself president. First mm -hmm. president, what would I do? Yeah, well, of course, if I was president. The two things that concern me most about Ghana now is the unemployment and is the value of the city in people's pockets. Mm. Because you can't build a nation where the person has in, whose salary cannot pay his transport, cannot rent, cannot pay medical bills, extra. You don't have a life. We've all become we become respectable poor. The two things that I'll do, and, and I've said this so many times, I'll start to invest in agriculture. Because if you invest in agriculture, all along the value chain, you're going to create a lot of jobs. Alongside giving the support for agriculture, I will start to devalue the city. The city is overvalued. I mean, I've said this so many times. You know, in 2000 and 13, I've talked about the city. 2014, 15, 16, 2000, sorry, 2014, I talked about city. I said overvaluation. I said, let's do agriculture. In 2015, I said we're heading for a crash. In 2016, I said the economy was broken. You can't start to talk certain things to a man who's hungry. That's fine. So the two things that concern me, I'll start to invest in agriculture to create jobs and increase the value of the city in people's pockets. That's the first thing I'll do. And as part of, uh, as, as part of my measures to increase investment in agriculture, and increase food production, I'll start to devalue the city to make uh, farming competitive. Once I've solved that problem, and that will solve Ghana's unemployment problem, solve our exchange rate problems, once I've solved that problem, I'll start to do other things. But you can't start to preach to people who are hungry. And we're hungry. Our children are home with nothing to do, and there are no prospects. So you can't start to talk big English. Create jobs. Create jobs increase the value of the cities in people's pockets mm. then you can do other things and don't come and tell me about gdp surplus um, imf i don't really care i couldn't care less it's about the value of the city in my pocket and that my children have jobs so that is the one problem that we have to solve first and look we have to put that as an number one priority and forget everything else because in any case, success, you need to make sacrifices. We can't do everything. Let's say these are our priorities and solve that problem. Once we solve that problem, other things will, we can do other things. Mm. You talked about um, reading as we wrap up. Uh, let's get to know a little more about what you do in your own spare time. You like to read a lot. What else do you do to relax? You know, I, 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 you know life, my, 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 my hobby, my space, and my Activities in that space is the continuum. You know, I used to play golf, but now I don't play. Now um, I bought some, um, we're together with my son, I've got a young son. So we're doing, um, we, we bought some model helicopters. So that's what we try and do. And I actually enjoy, you know, on weekends, I do a book review with my daughter. She, she comes from school, she has to do a book review. It's class one. And I actually enjoy that. And just with the kids, that's it. All the most Saturdays I work. But in the spare time, and then I, I, I watch a lot of um, cookery programs. Mm. I watch this, you know, I watch um, Gordon Ramsay. Um, I watch Master Chef. It's not so much the food, but I, I'm fascinated about how people can be creative. It, it just fascinates me. You know, I'm thinking you are given some ingredients, and, and some of the things they come up with, I think, wow, you know. I find it fascinating. Mm. Those sort of things I do. Interesting things I do. Uh, what's the last book you read? The last book I read was I read Decline and Fall. Decline and Flow by Evelyn Wall. Decline and Fall. 
I mean, I found it fascinating. It's an old English book, you know, but I thought the writing was very beautiful. And what I like is that some of these books allow you to get into the, the, the era in which were written. That was mm -hmm. so beautiful. Uh, there's a book that I read about uh, Afghanistan. It was called um, A Thousand Splendid Sons. A Thousand Splendid Sons. That's a beautiful book, you know. So, and, and I would really encourage everybody to read. I've tried to set up a book club, but they like so many times, but I failed. And the thing that, well, Mr. Thompson, no, but it's the right thing to do, and I'll continue to insist that until you become successful. <laughs> successful. Yes, because it's the right thing to do. All of mankind's knowledge is in a book. And somebody said to me, "Oh, Mr. Thompson, by saying knowledge is in a book, you know, but my grandfather doesn't read; he's illiterate by his grandma. He hasn't got knowledge; he's got wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge." are two different things so Ghanaians please read I mean please read that's where your, your, your salvation is going to come from please read just read read anything read 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 this is where we bring the curtain down on our conversation today on the executive lounge and thank you very much mr. Ken Thompson for making time for us thank you for asking me Five things I always take away from our conversations and uh, from Mr. Ken Thompson today is that uh, be accepting of other people, be liberal, and also always work to the highest standard you could possibly because that's how success is built. Beyond that, read, read, read. And also, don't stand still. Be innovative because if you stand still, someone will be innovative and they'll eat you up. And finally, you should say it like it is, just like he does. It's been fun having you on the Executive Lounge, and we look forward to having you again. See you next time. Shalom. Make rain.